a warrior's joy. Any soldier, any warrior, what motivates them to go to battle? What is it that stirs their spirit enough to engage in that which would cause them to be in harm's way or under danger? And I would suggest to you that the joy of a warrior is not unlike the motivation of God himself, who is our warrior, which is his love for you. You're God's motivation to go to battle. He knows you by name. We've said that many times. He knows the details about your life. He knows where you struggle. He knows where you're euphoric with joy. He knows your moments of great victory. He knows your goals and your dreams. You are the motivation of God's heart. That's why he has gone to battle for you, and that's why as long as you and I draw breath, God will be your champion. God fights for you. That's the motivation. Jesus said this, greater love has no one than this, than that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends, Jesus says. So on a day or a weekend like we're celebrating in our country, it's important and appropriate that we would say again, freedom is never free. We owe a great debt to the men and women who stood a moment ago. We owe a great debt to the men and women who not only served in our country and overseas, in foreign lands, to go to battle for us, who even sacrificed their life, so we could enjoy the freedom that we have in our country. Think about this with me for a minute. Different wars in our consciousness in the country. World War I, what do you know about it? Had a grandpa or great-grandpa who, saw, who fought in World War I? World War II, stories of D-Day and charging the beaches of Normandy against the great heavy artillery that was there on the coast of France. Heavy casualties to fight, to get a toehold into Europe and begin to push back the enemy. Or Korea, or Vietnam, or the Gulf Wars, Afghanistan, Iraq, terrorism all over the world. That's a hard one, isn't it? Wherever they are. But the men and women who still, on our behalf, suit up and go to fight that our freedom could be sustained, that they would protect the innocent, that we would live safely in our country as citizens of this great land, never forget that freedom has a cost. Men and women have experienced self-denial, sacrifice, and even the loss of their lives, the spilling of blood so that you and I could assemble in a place like this in a country where we're free and worship God or enjoy the privileges and the opportunities that we have in this country that we love, America. We should be grateful. But let's connect the dots and talk about God as a warrior. Throughout the whole of the scriptures, there's so many images and so many verses that say God is a warrior who fights on your behalf to rescue us, to defeat our enemies, to save our lives, to save our souls. But most of all, remember what I told you is his motive to win our hearts. So it isn't just that you and I would say, oh yeah, well, it's good. We live in freedom and I'm not worried about burning in hell because God forgives me. God wants that you and I, whom he's created for his own self, that we would return his love and live with hearts devoted to him in loyalty. God wants to win your heart. So you don't just trust him, but you love him. Him. And you live your life with an adoration of love that understands the sacrifice that God has done so we could be His. 
Let's think about a couple examples in the Old Testament when God was the warrior who fought the battle for his people. In the whole book of Exodus, they're enslaved in Egypt. Moses comes. Does he come with a fighting army to deliver them from Pharaoh's power? No. He just uses the elements of nature and supernatural acts of intervention with the ten plagues and whoops Pharaoh. And then when Pharaoh has the audacity to chase him into the wilderness, God uses the Red Sea to swallow up the enemy. The battle is the Lord's. Or do you remember the story of Jericho when they crossed into the promised land and there was this huge fortified city? Did they have to actually charge the walls of Jericho? No, they marched around it seven days and on the seventh day seven times, blowing their trumpets, praising God, and the walls come down. By whose power? The soldiers? The battle is the Lord's. You remember the story of Gideon? They were going to fight the Midianites. There were 32,000 soldiers that showed up. The Lord said to Gideon, you got too many men. What? You got too many men. Go tell them, if any of you are scared, go home. 22,000 went home. Now you got 10,000 men. The Lord says, you still got too many soldiers. I don't want you after the enemy is defeated to say, we did this with our own power and strength. So he sent them to a place where they were to drink water and those that scooped the water into their hands to drink, these were the ones that were retained to fight, the Midians. 300, 300 against thousands. And in the middle of the night, they smashed their lamps and shouted for the Lord. And the enemy was so disoriented by God's work in their minds that they began to battle themselves. And Gideon led 300 men in a great battle. The battle is the Lord's. Remember when the Philistines were attacking God's people And the giant Goliath was intimidating them day after day. And the soldiers, thousands of them, cowered at the shout of the giant. David, the boy, shows up, armor's too big to put on, and he takes a slingshot, and he stands in front of the giant and says, You come to me with sword and shield and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. The battle is the Lord's. It's still true today. I don't know what circumstances are going on in your life. I don't know what battles you're facing. I don't know if it's financial or relational or family dynamics or the loss of a loved one or illness. I don't know what your circumstances are that are too powerful for you to deal with alone. But this I know, child of God, by faith, the battle is the Lord's. In faith, have you asked God's Spirit to be released to work on your behalf? Have you asked God for his power to change people's hearts, to change circumstance, to heal your body, to open up new opportunities, or to give you the courage inside to rise up and persevere and push through. Whatever it is, what I want you to know is the Lord is your champion and the battle is the Lord's. So as I said a few minutes ago, we're starting the series on the prophets. The prophet's message was consistent. Thus says the Lord, God's people through history wandered away from God, did what they pleased. Sound familiar? They were unfaithful. They disregarded the wisdom of God's word. Whatever God said he wanted them to do, they did what they wanted to do. They on times even openly rebelled against God. They compromised themselves to child sacrifice and idolatry and other forms of wickedness. And we too baptized and marked with the cross, knowing our identity, sometimes follow our shadow side. 
Sometimes we're unfaithful. Sometimes we do absolutely wrong stuff, stupid stuff, foolish stuff, and we wander away. Well, the message of the prophets was, come back to God. Don't live in a way that disregards the Lord of the universe. Come back. He'll heal you. He'll restore you. He will cleanse your heart. He will renew his love for you. That's the message of the prophets. So Zephaniah prophesied in Jerusalem. He was of royal blood. He was the great-grandson of King Hezekiah. His grandfather was Manasseh, who was a very evil king. His father was Ammon, who was even more evil than his father. And there was widespread worship of idols in the high places. There was child sacrifice. It was all forms of wickedness where they disregarded God. We think our culture is bad right now. Do you know that in that time period where Zephaniah was rising up to prophesy that the word of God was lost in the temple? They didn't even have the book out when they went through the ritual and rhythm of their worship life. The word of God was in some back room collecting dust. So when the boy, Josiah, became king, it was about that time they discovered the tablets of the law. They discovered God's word. And Josiah instituted huge reform to the country. We're going to live by God's word King Josiah said. It was in the reign of Josiah that Zephaniah rose up, not still in royal blood, but to be a man of God as a prophet, to say again, the Lord is going to clear away from you all forms of evil. He is going to defeat your enemies. He's going to bring you back to himself. And you heard that in the words that we shared, how God begged for the people to come back to him. Now, I don't know where you're at on your spiritual journey, each one of you individually, but if you're in need of turning the wagon around so that it's facing the Lord... It's a good day to do that. It's a good day to hear the voice of God calling us to say, come back, child. Come back to me that I might love you. That's the message of Zephaniah. So we have this powerful painting of God as a warrior, a champion, victorious warrior who has already won the battle, who's coming home, and now here's the picture. God comes home as the champion warrior and picks up his child, says, God is with you. He has not deserted you. He has not abandoned you. He's not given up on you, but like a parent would delight in the child in his arms. That's how God sees you. He holds you in his arms. It says that he exalts over you with joy. He won't rebuke you anymore. He quiets you in his love. And he's so full of joy because of you that he bursts into song and sings for joy. Yesterday, Denise and I were together with our son Luke our daughter-in-law, Leave, and our granddaughter, Pema. Pema's not quite a year old. So when she looks at crazy Papa, she kind of looks at me a little wary, a little skeptical. Or if I come and I want to pick her up, the lips begin to quiver, and she looks at her mom like, save me. <laughs> but what does Papa want to do? Papa wants to hold her. Papa wants to win her heart. Papa wants to hold her in my arms and get to know her. Papa wants her to be so comfortable with me that she would lay her head on my shoulder and snuggle in. Take that image now and think about how God has a passion that you would be his. 
that he would win your heart so that you would snuggle in to the promises and the presence of God in such a way that you go, God, you're my God and you're my friend and I will trust in you because you're going to win the battle for me. I'd like to tell you a story about a Vietnam vet named Dave Reaver. He's got quite a story. He was raised in Texas and at the age of 21 he married his high school sweetheart who was 18 He was drafted, but he already was a seminary student, so he had a letter of exemption, didn't have to go. But then he kept night after night listening to the news reports from Vietnam of the people, the great loss of life, those who were killed in action, and he just felt God's Spirit compelling him to enlist. So Dave Reaver enlisted in the Navy, kissed his sweetheart goodbye, told her, I'll be back without scars. What a foolish promise. He was trained to be a foregunner on a riverboat in one of the heaviest combat areas of Vietnam. He said, I was holding a white phosphorus hand grenade up to throw it. It was six inches from my ear and a sniper's bullet hit the hand grenade and it detonated setting my body on fire, and here are his words. I looked down, and my face was on my boots. My chest was ripped open, and I looked down, and I saw my own heart beating. Blood was pumping out of an open artery, and skin was literally melting off my body. They put me on a stretcher and they thought I was dead, so they flipped me face down on the stretcher. There was so much phosphorus still on my body that the stretcher caught fire on the way to the helicopter and I dropped through. Eventually, I got on the helicopter and the medic that was riding by my side was filling out paperwork for KIA, killed in action. And he was aware he was conscious. He yelled. He had to plug his, uh, his uh, air tube. He plugged his air tube and yelled, Medic! And the man almost jumped out of the helicopter and realized he was still alive. They flew him to stabilize him in a hospital nearby. And after a period of stabilization, they shipped him to Japan where he continued his recovery, not only from the great marring to his body, but burns all over his body. And when he was in that Japanese hospital, he asked them to bring him a mirror. And he looked in the mirror. He said, that day was worse for me than the day I was wounded in Vietnam because that day I lost hope. I lost hope that my wife would still love me. How could you love a freak, he said. How could you love a monster? The day came where his wife was going to come visit him in the hospital. The man who was laying next to him had his wife come. They were in a burn unit together, and his wife came, looked at the man lying by his side in the next bed, took her wedding ring off, threw it on his chest, and said, I'd be ashamed to be seen with you. Reaver was thinking about what it was being like when his wife came and saw him. So she walks in the room with the doctor, and the doctor says, here's your husband, Dave Reaver. She said, that's not my husband. The doctor said, yes, ma'am, this is your husband. She took his wrist and saw his name on the wrist, Dave Reaver. She said, well, it is my husband. She said, welcome home, Davey. I want you to know that I love you. And she bent over and she kissed him on the cheek. And when she straightened up from the kiss to welcome him home with words of love, there was scar tissue stuck to her lips. And Dave Reaver says, the love of my wife and my faith in Jesus Christ gave me the courage to keep living as they put my body back together and as I healed. 
we owe a great debt to those who have served us for the cause of freedom, don't we? But here's also what I want you to take from that story. Now Dave Reaver is employed by the armed services of our government. They call him a resiliency coach. He goes to soldiers that have been wounded, who have lost hope, who are fighting depression or are even suicidal. And he says, they pay me to tell them that hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the armed services. Life is hard. I don't know your full story, but I know this. I know that we all fall. I know that there are periods of rejection or disappointment or sadness or grieving or brokenness. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who has hung on the cross for us, whose blood spilled out, also kisses you in all your wounded places. He knows you. And he kisses you where you're wounded and broken or hurt or ashamed or guilty and says, you belong to me. You see, Jesus, who had all power and all authority, gave up his power and glory, submitted to the Roman soldiers, submitted to the warped justice of Pilate because he knew that his spilled blood flowing from the cross would forgive our sins and heal our wounds and reconcile us to the Father. Never forget. Remember, Jesus Christ is your warrior. And wouldn't it be absurd, wouldn't it be sad, if he who gave his life that we might be free and be forgiven now was rejected, by our evil or our indifference or our arrogance. He whose arms are open. He's done it so that you and I might be forgiven. He's done it so that we could be in a relationship with our Heavenly Father. He's done it to win your heart.